Now, as part of this test, as part of this test, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the entire universe as our servants. That's one of the essential points of, of this test. So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created around us, everything in the sky, the air, the clouds, the rain, everything on the land, trees, animals, and everything under the ground, iron, metals, etc., have all been created at our disposal in order that we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that we obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of this has been created for us. And that is an enormous and major blessing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not bound to create this environment for us. He could have made nothing for us. But he created a situation where he made the entire world halal, and then he prohibited a few things upon us, which would then act as a test to make sure that we would live within the, the realm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's law. So most of the things that Allah created are permissible for us. The only thing that we're asked to do is to remember Allah when we use the things that He created and to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what He created. Very simple. And then to avoid a few things which you can name on your fingers. Pork, alcohol, interactions between men and women. There's just a few things. You can count them on one hand that you have to avoid uh, in order to succeed in your test in this particular life. As part of our using this universe, and as part of our test, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created three ways by which we could interact with our universe to gain information about our surroundings. So there are essentially three ways by which we gain information about our surroundings. The first is the five senses. We use our five senses to ascertain what's going on around us. So I look with my eyes and I can see the color green. I touch and I can feel whether something is soft or firm. I taste and I can tell whether something is sweet or sour. I smell and I can tell whether something has a fragrance or what type of fragrance it has. And I hear and I can identify certain sound waves. So these five senses that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created for us these were ways by which we could gain information in order to interact with our environment. Where the five senses end, where their power and ability stops, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created reason and intellect. So you have the five senses. They gather a certain amount of information about the environment. That information is processed within the brain and through the intellect to produce new information. And so this is what we call science. This is science today. We make observations, we think about them, we reflect upon them, we put those observations together and we come up with theories, laws, etc. That's science. That's how we gain knowledge. That's the essence of man gaining knowledge. So where the five senses end, the intellect begins. Now, the five senses have the ability to be wrong. Sometimes something can be so hot or so cold that it burns and feels hot. Sometimes you might look at something and it might look green, but in essence it's truly red. So sometimes our five senses, they make mistakes. Sometimes you feel something and you think it's soft, but it's actually hard. So this occurs especially in sickness. You taste something that's sweet and it tastes sour. So the five senses have a limited ability and they can make mistakes. Similarly, reason has a limited ability and reason makes mistakes as well. That's the history of science. Pick up science books from 100 years ago, from 300 years ago, from 500 years ago, and you still hear the most wacky and crazy things that they came up with. So they made mistakes. They used their five senses and they used their intellect and they thought the world was flat. But then eventually it was disproved although the whole world believed that the world was flat for a certain period of time, eventually reason was shown to be wrong and it was later that theory was revised and now we call the world an ellipse. So basically the five senses have the ability to be wrong and reason has the ability to be wrong. Where the five senses end, reason begins. 
and where reason ends, wahi begins. And wahi is that source of knowledge that can A, never be wrong, and that B, can never be arrived at except through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are the three ways by which we gain information or knowledge in our existence. The five senses up to intellect. And then intellect, where its ability ends, wahi begins. Wahi tells us things that the intellect can never come up with. And only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can we derive the wahi. So our essence in these, in these few days, or our, the essence of this gathering, is to discuss wahi. So you need to understand wahi in the paradigm of knowledge, because that's how we're going to be able to appreciate how beautiful it truly is. So, five, in five senses, then intellect, and then at the highest source of knowledge, and the highest source of information within the deen, is the wahi. Now keep in mind that the five senses and the intellect actually lead you down the path of wahi. You can't compare any intellect with wahi because wahi is so far and above any human being's intellect. But the five senses and the intellect are designed to get you to wahi. So we look at, with our eyes and we see the beautiful trees and we hear the beautiful birds and we feel all that Allah has created and we taste the beautiful and different variety of foods and our mind gathers all that variety and information and says there is no way that any of this could be random. There must be a creator. And then in order to learn about the creator, we have to go to Wahi. Because the mind can't come up with Allah. Allah is incontainable. But at least our five senses and reason can join together in order to help us realize that there must be a creator and that creator then subsequently in order to inform us has revealed wahi upon various messengers throughout the history of mankind. So this is how wahi fits in to our realm of knowledge. This paradigm is extremely important for people to understand. Because if you understand this paradigm then you'll be able to understand so much more that ties into it. For example, one principle that you can gain from this is that wahi is above and beyond any intellect. Therefore, wahi does not need to be comprehended by intellect. That's very important in this day and age. Because in this day and age, we, begin, we have begun as Muslims to try to justify wahi using intellect. And that's the wrong approach. So when we explain why alcohol is haram, we have to give so many reasons why it's haram. We say alcohol is haram because people get drunk and then they'll drive drunk. Or people or get, become abusive. Or people can't concentrate in their prayer. Fine. Those might be wisdoms behind why alcohol is haram. But the real reason why alcohol is haram is because Allah told us that alcohol is haram and that's it. You don't need anything more. We don't have to understand why something is haram. If tomorrow all the scientists of the world write a paper enumerating the benefits of alcohol, it will still remain haram. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has deemed it haram and wahi is far and above any human being's intellect. So we don't go about justifying the wahi through intellect. Fine. Intellect can provide wisdom behind the wahi. And intellect can help you to better understand the wahi. But in its essence, the wahi is certain and the intellect is vun, it's conjecture, it's theory. So we should be very, very clear in this day and age especially that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals something or when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says something, that's it. And in fact, if you go through the science of hadith, you'll see that the biggest discussion in verifying the hadith is not what the hadith says. You don't look at what the hadith says and then say the hadith must be right or sahih or not sahih. You look at the chain. If you can establish that the Prophet Sallallahu made a statement, then the, whatever the statement is, it's automatically accepted as part of the collection of hadith. We don't judge a hadith based on the content of the hadith. We, be, we judge a hadith based on the chain of narrators. Because all we have to do is connect it to the Prophet Sallallahu to make it wahi, because the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu is also wahi, and therefore it puts it above any type of reason or intellect. So that's an important point 
in this paradigm. The other important point to realize is that the intellect and the senses can make mistakes. And I discussed this briefly a few minutes ago. Our senses, they make mistakes. Sometimes we see something as close and it's really far. Sometimes we think we heard something and we didn't. How many times are you, have you sat with a, a friend or your wives or your mothers and you say, did the phone just ring? And then they say, well, I didn't hear the phone ring. And then you go closer to the phone and you see that it, never, it wasn't ringing. You just thought you heard it ringing. So the, there, your senses make a mistake. Similarly, our intellect makes a mistake. Think how many times in the past we've been so adamant about our view. And then later on we only learned that our thinking was wrong and actually something else was correct. But wahi is never wrong. Wahi can never be a mistake. Once you've established something from the Prophet ﷺ or from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is automatically 100% correct regardless of whether you understand it or you don't. That's very, very important that this idea be kept in mind. This was the understanding of the Sahaba. This was the depth of their understanding and this was what made their iman what it, what it was in that day and age. 